And so he kind of takes him and he goes a step further with it. And this idea is that our senses cause impressions. So when you have an experience, think for just a second. Did you ever have an experience where you felt something hot and you burned your finger? Maybe as a child. A long time ago. I had a bad experience where something hurt you. Do you have anybody have that experience? Something hurt you as a child? And you can you can remember that. You remember, ooh, don't touch the stove, mama was right, it's hot. Okay? Or uh, maybe you can think of an event uh, that happened to you that uh, was very traumatic or painful or something like that. And you can go, oh, you can remember it like yesterday. It was it's so vivid in your mind. Alright, well his idea is that the reason you remember it is that you have sense impressions. When, when you experience anything, it leaves an impression in your mind. Okay? These impressions uh, or simple ideas correspond to the impressions. So you have impressions made and then these simple ideas are formed in your mind. Now, he builds an atomic theory of the operation of the mind out of this concept. He says simple ideas are like atoms. Simple ideas are like atoms, while complex ideas are like molecules com composed of smaller units. Everybody taking biology in here, right? Chemistry or something. You got the, the gist of this, of course. You're all here by now. You took something in high school. So you know what atom and a molecule is. All right, so he's got the idea that your mind, your memory, and your, your thought life is formed by these kinds of impressions. Okay, let's go back to, the, to John Locke for just a second. I'm going to backtrack a little bit and bring him into this. Can you conceive of anything new that you have never seen before? Can you conceive of anything new that you have never seen before? Can you imagine something new in your mind that you've never seen? No. John Locke would say, you're right, you can't. Because... Even, for example, the Pegasus, whoever came up with that concept, you've seen a horse and you've seen a winged creature. You've seen a swan or whatever. You're just cutting and pasting. You're photoshopping in your mind, aren't you? That's how you come up with new ideas. You're really photoshopping, all right? And you're cutting the wings off of one creature and tacking them onto a horse and saying, ah, oh, Pegasus, all right? So that's what Locke would say. You, you don't have, can anybody imagine a color that you've never seen? Now, you got it. This class is on something here. You guys are tracking. Like, the first thing you said, like, can you picture something that you've never seen? But what about if you've heard about some, something? Like, ground zero or whatever, with a plane exploded or stuff or whatever. Okay. Like, I never saw, like, the actual, you know, I can picture it in my head. You're imagining, though. It's not your imagination isn't going to be accurate to what the real what, okay. ground zero looks like. So you're just imagining. And you're imagining what? Now, that's a fine example. You're imagining some other large building and what it looked like. If somebody described to you a skyscraper taller than anyone you've ever seen and had, you know, uh, mirrored windows you know, all the way around it, well, okay, yeah, I can imagine that. But you're really imagining something you've already seen. It's not going to exactly correspond to... What, what they're talking about, but it, it might be close, but it's still, you're taking from what you've already seen. I've been to downtown Dallas, I've seen the skyline in Dallas, they got some big tall buildings, and some of them are mirrored windows all the way around, and, uh, okay, well, I just blow that up a little bit and make it bigger than planet in New York, and go, okay, that's what it kind of looked like, Twin Towers, you know, whatever. So you're taking, you're, you're cutting and pasting in your mind. You're, you're, you're cutting from one memory, and you're pasting it to a new memory. You're, you're, you're creating a new one by compiling from previous knowledge. And that's all they're saying is that you don't know anything innately. You only know what you've experienced. See, that's, that gives a little, bit of, a little bit of credibility to what they're saying because you realize that, yeah, I, don't, I can't come up with anything new. It, it's coming from somewhere, and I'm adapting that to a new thought. Well, what about deja vu? Deja vu, the feeling that you've been somewhere before. Okay, well, I mean, that's a feeling, though. Well, that's just a feeling. Not like in you're not understand. Paranormal activity or something going on, huh? Might be. Alright. Okay. Alright, so everybody tracking the, the small ideas. With Hume, we're, we're moving on. Uh, you've got the idea of 
little impressions. So you might have, I remember how something feels, and then you remember the, the complex would be like remembering an, an event that happened, remembering when you went out on your birthday, and you remember the whole thing. So that would be like a complex idea. And a simple impression would be, a simple idea would be, I remember feeling a desk. Okay, that's pretty simple. And a complex idea would be, I remember my graduation ceremony or something of that nature. Okay? I remember the horrors of Robin's philosophy class. And that would be a complex idea. Right? Okay. Uh, so he argues that, Hume argues that events or effects do not require a cause and refutes the principle that whatever begins to exist must have a cause of existence. Now this is very important, and Hume uses this idea. If you're, if you're shooting an eight ball, okay, how many of you shoot pool? Billiards, pool, whatever you want to call it. I mean, it's dependent on what status you play. Okay, if you go down to the pool hall, it's pool. Um, if you go and shoot pool, uh, and you call uh, eight ball in the corner pocket, if you, if you do this, well, Hume would say, you cannot say that when you hit that cue ball and it touched that eight ball, that it was the cause of that eight ball going into the corner pocket. All you can say is, is that you, phenomenologically, as you saw it, you witnessed the cue ball go this way. The next thing you see is the eight ball go this way. That's what you saw and that's what you know. What you can't say that you know is, is that it was the cause of the eight ball going in the corner pocket. He would say you cannot know cause and effect. You can only know what you observe. See what I'm getting at? Now, that, that defies common sense to us, doesn't it? it? It just defies common sense. There are instances where we, you know, we can take it a step further and say, well, is it, you know, our economic decline, is it necessarily a result of somebody invading another country? Is, is that really what's caused our economic problems? People are blaming on that. Is that necessarily the cause of it? Some people say, well, yeah, absolutely. You see this happened first and then this happened second. Well, it was the cause. I'm, I'm stretching this out a little bit further beyond just physical uh, simple stuff. But we might have to allow for, there could have been some other reason for that economic problem. Okay, same thing with the shooting the pool. It could be, you didn't see it happen, but it could be that somebody was sitting underneath that table with a magnet, and as soon as that cue ball got close to the eight ball, that magnet stopped the cue ball. And then there was somebody else with another magnet underneath the table that caused that eight ball to go in the corner. That could have been what really happened, but you don't know. You didn't see that. So all you saw was the phenomenon. The cue ball hit that eight ball, it appears, and then the eight ball went in the corner pocket. See what, see what I'm saying? He says you cannot prove cause and effect. You can't prove it. You can just say this is what I observed. All right? Okay, he argues that... Now, here's one of the things... We, and it's, this is something we don't get in, into until uh, later on with philosophy and religion. But one, one of the things that he's doing here is he is undermining um, a philosophical argument for the existence of a God. Because if you can get rid of cause and effect, then if you come into agreement with that, then what you're doing is, is you're allowing for a... Uh, argument that says you can't talk about a creator God anymore being of necessity because you can't call it, you can't you can't say that you know a a cause by its effect. You see what I'm saying? You're undermining it. You have cut that argument out. God so, yeah, exactly. And in, in a nutshell that, that's kind of where he's going with that. Okay? That's that's kind of where he's getting he was, he was a little bit antagonistic toward the Christian faith, frankly. And so, that, this is kind of the direction he's going in. Alright, uh, the results are the elimination of such things as natural science, though, metaphysics, and common sense beliefs. As I mentioned, this is one of the problems with Hume, is that it's just downright common sense that that cue ball made that eight ball go in my pocket. <laughs> if anybody disagrees, then you're welcome to, to, to disagree with me. But I think that we 